Hey there folks, this is Green XI welcoming you right back to Let's Play Yuminiko. This is episode 114. In the last episode, we saw Will trying to interrogate the person who believes in magic the most out of the entire family. Uh, except maybe Kinzo? Not sure. Uh, <laughs> and that is Maria. He went directly to her and tried to find out more about the witch version of Beatrice and why she exists and how they met. So, what we saw at the, last, uh, at the end of the last episode was that he was now going to go to the people who are perhaps a little bit less likely on the chessboard to, to believe in the witch Beatrice. So that's going to be more interesting because I feel like with Maria and the, the witchy side of it, we've seen all the way through the game, in every arc, pretty much. Um, yeah, every arc, I would say. How how magic exists and how it can exist and stuff. But now we're going to start seeing the, the more cynical side from the other characters, maybe. So, looks like we're starting with Jessica. Ha-ha! <laughs> I apologize for our successor Sama's lack of courtesy back there. It's not going to leave a mark, is it? Talk about Merciless. Did you say something, Jessica? Of course not. I've already uh, learned my lesson, okay? Leon, who had apparently been chatting with the adult siblings, spun around with a smile and stared at Jessica. Looks like the older siblings firmly in control around here. Those are some sharp ears. I think I'm finally getting this Leon person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our successor Sam has always been weirdly sharp. And the adults are always gushing about that kid. And I'm always getting compared to that, both at home and at school. Come to think of it, Leon was the student council president during both middle school and high school. And the head of the badminton team too. So everywhere you go, you get compared to Leon, and it doesn't match up too uh, too well for you. I said it as soon as I got into middle, middle school. Our successor Sama was already the vice president of the student council. I said, if you're planning to become council president next year, that'll just put more pressure on me, so stop it. But the next year rolls around, and guess who announces their candidacy and wins by a landslide election? Same thing again in high school. I said, please just give it a rest this time. You're already vice president. But when year three rolls around, our successor Sama gets the council president job again. Dad was oh so proud. Mom kept saying, now you make sure you do your best as a little sister, over and over and over again. Yeah. But even so, you were still proud to be Leon's little sister, weren't you? It's not like I ever thought of it that way. Yeah, of course not. Why would I? It can be tough to be compared against perfection. But other people are other people, and you are you. There's no point letting it get you down. Live how you want to, with all you've got, and you'll be fine. Of course. But Mom and the others are always gonna going on about how I need to follow in Assure Maya Leon's footsteps as a little sister. They keep telling me to go join the student council, to go play badminton. You don't play in a rock band, do you? What? <laughs> That's a secret, okay. Apparently she's keeping it a secret from her family. Interesting. People tend to blame things on their family and how they were raised. But this Jessica girl always likes doing the same thing, even in a different world and a different family. It's admirable that she has such a true and constant interest in something. I loved it. That Petten Petten song? That Dokian Dokian song? <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the extraordinarily accomplished sort like Leon, but kids who act their age do have their charms. That's the best way to go through life. Enjoy your youth to the fullest. Thanks. Apparently, no one had ever told Jessica that they approved of how she lived. And the direct way Will had put it made her turn red and hang her head in embarrassment. I want to ask you two now. The same thing you just asked Maria-chan? Yeah. Please tell me everything you know about Beatrice. Well, you can see how much Maria-chan loves witches and the occult. For her, Beatrice is a symbol to be admired, like an anime heroine. Whenever some trivial thing happens, she believes it's some witch pranking her with magic. You really are an adult, and so is the fact that you'd never say that to Maria, even if you think it. Of course. Childhood dreams only happen when you're a kid. I think respecting that precious experience is an adult's responsibility. Looks like the two of us will get along well. George's position was that Beatrice was nothing more than a fairy tale. However, that phrase, respecting a child's dreams is the adult thing to do, that might be worthy of further scrutiny. When she got candy from Beatrice by magic, Maria probably got excited and told George and the others. Then the adults followed his lead and actively supported that story as adults should. 
However, we can conceive of a similar situation coming up besides an adult interacting with a child. For example, what about a subordinate interacting with a superior? If Kinzo, tyrant of the Ishuramaya family, claimed that Beatrice existed and had revived, perhaps the other members of the family would actively support that story, as his subordinates should. Though Beatrice only appeared directly in front of a limited number of people, it's probably safe to say that the concept of her existence penetrated deeply within the Ishuramaya family, even among those who had never seen her. However, no matter how deeply that concept penetrated, she was only viewed as a sort of fairy tale character. It would be necessary to transform the concept of that character from an imaginary fairy tale into reality. So a person attempting to do this would need to perform acts that no one could explain without magic. These acts were the witch incidents, starting with the window opening pranks played by Beto the Elder, and ending with the closed room murders. Oh god, that confused me then, that and going on two lines. <laughs> Beto the Elder talked about this, saying that the anti-magic power filling the mansion would be weakened bit by bit the more she made her existence known. Beatrice Why were you willing to go so far to make everyone besides you accept your existence? Because that fiction will become the truth if everyone acknowledges it. Because at that moment, the being called Beatrice will be acknowledged and will become human. In that case, until Beatrice is acknowledged by all people, she's less than human. She's furniture. Why would furniture want to become human? I seem to remember this being a theme in the previous game. It's because they want to gain a right. Furniture cannot... Huh? So they try to become human because they want the right to... Whatever. It's extremely simple. After all, it's directly connected to the reason Chick Beedo was born in the first place. I see. I understand, but it's complicated. Yeah, you can't neglect the heart. I feel bad for saying this at Beatrice's funeral. But truth be told, I don't know enough about this person called Beatrice to tell you much about her. My apologies. Jessica Chan does live here, so she might know a little more than I do. Speaking of which, have you introduced yourself to this gentleman yet, Jessica Chan? No, not yet, actually. There's this idiot going around pinching people's butts, so I didn't really have the chance. <laughs> a bit late, Jessica looked embarrassed for acting rudely in front of an unfamiliar guest. She cleared her throat and made a beautiful bow that didn't fit well with her normal attitude. She even lifted the corners of her skirt in a curtsy. Pleased to meet you. My name is Jessica. Allow me to welcome you to the Ishuramaya family on this splendid day. I mean, please enjoy our, our hospitality and... Will add. Call me Will. <laughs> huh? Huh? What? Jessica's greeting had been of the old-fashioned sort, so Will also treated her like an old-fashioned lady. Bending down on one knee, taking Jessica's right hand and kissing it. What? Wh wh Not expecting her greeting to be returned in such an old-fashioned and formal way, Jessica turned red and was unable to speak. However, Will had returned the greeting in what he thought was a perfectly serious way, so he didn't understand what was making Jessica's face glow. Have I done something strange? No, no, not at all. <laughs> I want to hear what you know about Beatrice. Mm. A sparkle leaked around the edges of Will's right hand, which was grasping Jessica's hand. Looks like the theatre going power is having its effect on Jessica. Didn't mean for that to happen. Oh well. Beatrice, is it? Well, I can tell you, but will you promise me something? Promise you won't laugh? Think about it now. It sounds more than a little crazy. What is it you know? I won't laugh. Tell me. Sure. Where should I start? To me, the Golden Witch Beatrice is sort of like one of the seven mysteries of the Ashuramaya family. You've heard of those, right? Almost all schools have a set of tall tales or ghost stories that get passed down. Reminds me of Kingdom Hearts 2 when you're at the start of the game. <laughs> like on some days, the piano in the music room will play by itself. Or the skeleton in the science room dances around at night. Everyone's heard of them. But of course, that doesn't mean they believe in them. The stories about Beatrice were the same. It was just one of those strange tales about our way too big mansion. The servants would sometimes talk about seeing things during the night patrols. Sometimes I felt a bit annoyed about them turning my home into a place for ghost stories. But I didn't pay it any more attention than that. That's how little it mattered to me. So, during my normal, everyday life, I would completely forget about the name Beatrice. 
Of course, when that huge portrait was first hung, it definitely felt creepy. Even I tried not to meet her eyes after dark, so it's no surprise that the servants found it eerie. But that only lasted for a short while. We all walked by the portrait every day. We gradually got used to it, and eventually bored of it. I didn't really care anymore about the portrait of the mistress from Grandfather's Delusions. I get that. I'll bet it was different for the other relatives, who only came a few times a year. Exactly. That's why every time the family came for a family conference, they'd always stand in front of that portrait and talk about Beatrice. <laughs> so I was reminded of it every now and then. Oh, Beatrice, I've come to play again. I've written a new spell. Take a look at it later, okay? Ooh. You really do like Beatrice, don't you? You've been in such high spirits ever since Grandfather had this portrait hung. Huh? Where's Angie? She went back with Aunt Kyrie to take some medicine. Her body really is frail. Totally the opposite of Battler. She's the sort that gets sick whenever she's stressed. I also used to get sick on big holidays or trips. Maria is really tough by comparison. She's been talking about Beatrice non-stop since we left Nijima. Don't you think she's taken this a bit too far? It's not so bad, right? It's normal for kids to have an active imagination. If a kid told you that she'd met Santa Claus, would you tell her she's a liar? Well, of course I wouldn't go that far. Maria kept talking to the portrait as though it was an old friend. She promised to play with it later as if she was talking to a living human. George, a man, seemed to think that this behaviour from a younger member of the opposite sex was cute. But to be perfectly frank, Jessica, who was the same sex as Maria, found this behaviour a bit unpleasant, even though she realised that she was dealing with a younger girl. At one time, even I was fascinated by anime heroines and other fictional characters. However, Maria's behaviour seems, so, seems to signify something more direct than mere fascination. It's something more definite, more vivid. Am I the only one who notices something odd about her? I bet the others all notice too, but try to ignore it because of that adult dignity George Nissan is always talking about. My apologies everyone. The head is quite busy with his noble research. He wishes to eat lunch in his study today. Until a second ago, Kinso's children had been complaining that eating lunch with their father would give them indigestion. But now that they knew he wasn't coming, they started grumbling about how he should at least spare the time to come down during the annual family conferences. Then let's begin lunch, everyone. I, Goda, have made use of all my talent and experience to make sure that you guests who have come from so far away will be entirely satisfied with your meal. No one's stomach would fail to rumble after hearing that from the great chef Goda. By the time the splendid dishes were laid out, everyone had stopped talking about Kinzo's absence. It was now Angie's absence that was being discussed. Apparently, her stomachache had gotten so bad that both she and Kyrie couldn't make it to lunch. Poor thing. Goda, make sure you talk to Kyrie-san later and have some porridge made. Thanks for the concern. Sorry about all this. It seems she just can't handle much stress. That's how it is with young'uns. They're cute, at least when they're not regurgitating. <laughs> George used to do that all the time. He really was frail way back then, right? Let's not talk about the past. It's not exactly a mealtime topic. Oh, poor Angie. So she won't get to eat this yummy food? Yeah, poor kid. Let's make sure we play with her a lot when she gets better. Oh, no way. She can't play with me. <laughs> what are you talking about? Why? Because I'm going to play with Beatrice, of course. So I can't play with Angie. Play with Beatrice? You mean you're going to go off on your own again to mumble to yourself and read some book? Jessica slightly regretted that she hadn't been more tactful. However, she couldn't wipe away that uncomfortable feeling she got every time Maria talked about Beatrice. And that feeling slipped out through her words. Oh, I don't do it on my own. Beatrice was there too. Maria may be young, but she does know how to read a person's tone. She immediately burst out in anger, drawing the attention of everyone in the room. Normally, Rosa would have stopped her at this point. However, she happened to have gone to the bathroom at that moment. So there was no one to calm Maria down. Kee <laughs> Poor Jessica. 
you're just a clump of the toxin. With Beto's weak magical power now, she'd burn to a crisp if she ever appeared in front of you. But she will appear before you eventually. Yes, in front of everyone else too. <laughs> and then the door to the Golden Land will open. But who knows if you'll be invited in. Of course, she will take me there, to the Golden Land. But not Jessica. Not Jessica. Not someone who makes fun of Beatrice. Not an unenlightened, stupid, confused, filthy, toxin-stained human. Hehe. <laughs> Poor Jessica. <laughs> When someone makes fun of Beatrice, it's like Maria becomes a totally different person. There was a theory about Maria having multiple personalities, wasn't there? Multiple personalities? Yeah, that probably describes it perfectly. Or maybe that was Maria's idea of an ideal personality. You mean that thing about creating another self the way you want to be? Hmm? How do you know my motto? Well, I don't think too hard on it. You'll just get a headache. <laughs> that's, his, that's his saying, isn't it? <laughs> It was something Jessica once told Cannon. She'd been talking about how anyone can create another self in the image of the person they want to be. I think we heard those words somewhere near the beginning of the second game. Now that I think about it, some very interesting stuff's been mentioned since very early on. Everyone has a self they really want to become, but they can't do it. Their current self is always surrounded by their lifestyle and the limits placed on them, so they have no way of changing themselves. True. Changing yourself means changing your environment as well. That's not easy to do. So my idea was to leave who I am now alone. I'd create another self, one that I really wanted to be. You felt suffocated, forced to live the life of a rich family's daughter, and you envisioned the self that you wanted to be. But I couldn't do anything outlandish at home, of course. Mom would just start yelling at me. So I made my plan. At home, I'd obediently do what my parents said. But I'd also create a second self to do what I wanted. At home, you did everything your parents told you to, and outside, you did what you wanted. That's a good way to live. You should be proud. Hmm, <laughs> thanks. And well, if there's something you really want to be, and if you really work for it, it's easier to do than you'd think. I figured Maria was pretty much the same. You think Maria's doing the same thing when she gets excited and starts talking and talking? Sometimes I think that's the person Maria really wants to be. As the youngest member of the family, she's adored, but not respected. Every time she learns something, there's always someone in the family who already knows it. She doesn't get to show off her knowledge about anything. Whenever she does learn something new, we try to smile and praise her, but that might actually have hurt her. So Maria wanted to become an authority on something. It's something that all young boys and girls think when they want to shake off their childhood. It's not a bad feeling when you learn something new and your parents praise you. But when you realise that your parents already knew that thing, it sometimes feels like they're talking down to you. When a kid learns their one digit times table, their parents will probably praise them. However, inconsiderate parents will sometimes ask mean questions like, then what is 11 times 11? Or what is 16 times 16? Or something similar. If that happens, the kid will lose his feeling of accomplishment and will start to feel as though he could never surpass his parents. So it's easy to guess when Maria got interested in the occult, something no one else knew about, and started learning more and more about it. I think the person Maria wants to be is an authority on the occult who everyone respects. And if she talked about the occult during her everyday life, Rosa would hit her. So like you, she's been hiding this other self most of the time. That's what I think she's doing at times like this. Maybe I should say that this is her real self slipping through the cracks to cover up her normal self. Actually, I've had some experience with that myself. I've thought at times that it'd be nice to become a frail, secluded lady, so I'd pretend to cough a lot, and it sort of became a bad habit. Because everyone would be nice to you if you started having coughing fits. Oh no. Whenever the conversation turned to something I didn't like, or something that made me feel uncomfortable, I could do that to change the subject. I see. And that's another self you wanted to become. <laughs> I'd appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone about that. Then, just what is Maria's other self? An authority on the occult who can out-argue even adults? Or else does it have to do with her relationship with witches? Either way, denying Beatrice in front of Maria is clearly taboo. In her search for something more than her everyday life, Maria found it in Beatrice and inside herself. In that case, it's gone to the Golden Land with Beatrice. Maria's wish? Looks like we've gone off track. 
Anyway, Maria kept up that tantrum until Aunt Rosa got back. I should have let her be, but I fought back. He said there was no way Beatrice could exist. Something like that. If she exists, then just let me see her. Of course, once Maria started crying, I realised I'd gone too far. And then? At the end of the family conference, I was the only one still upset. Maria acted as though nothing had happened. Instead, she went off somewhere on her own and came back talking happily about how she'd played with Beatrice again. Everyone, me included, decided not to contradict her. By that time, it was best to just accept it and ignore it. Is that all you have to say about the family conference? About the conference, yes. What I want to talk about is what happened after the conference was over and everyone left. Even after the conference ended, I still felt a bit uncomfortable. If Maria had just stayed mad, we would have made up with each other and I could have put it all behind me. But since Maria got over it, it felt like I was the only one unsatisfied. Oh, my lady, why the gloomy face? Oh, it's you. It's nothing important. Did everyone make it back okay? If they're still on schedule, they should have reached the Najima airport by now. You've done your part well, my lady. I haven't done anything. It's your servants who have done a great job. Are you still upset by that fight you had with Maria Sama yesterday? Mm, sorta. Of. She's just a kid, right? It's not something you need to worry about, or grown up and in high school. Do you think all that was just a kid's nonsense? You mean, about Beatrice Sama? See, even you call her... Bold come in? Come on, Bold. I know you're the <laughs> Sama. <laughs> Even you call her Sama. Beatrice is the name of Grandfather's mistress, the person he's still infatuated with. I realise that. As a servant, Kumasawa-san can't speak of her indiscreetly. Still, that's now become the name of the fictitious witch who lives in this mansion. And it's almost natural for people to call her Sama. Beatrice is just a ghost story, created by the adults to stop us from wandering into the forest. Maria just thought it was interesting one day and decided to act like it was true. <laughs> if you say such things, you'll end up regretting it. After all, Beatrice Sama exists. Again, when you say stuff like that, you're just freaking me out. I may not be George Nissan, but I'm not going to go around shouting that Santa couldn't possibly exist. But that doesn't mean he actually exists. You'll find you're wrong there, my lady. Wrong? Oh, yes. The gods dwell in all things. In the same way, Beatrice Sama dwells in this mansion. Like the gods, Beatrice Sama will do you no harm if you respect her. As you say, it will be as though she doesn't exist. However, if you ever fail to show proper respect, her curse will descend upon you. Of course, this doesn't apply only to Beatrice Sama. <laughs> if there's a curse, let's see it. I'd just love to meet her. Lady, you mustn't say such things. Is she coming? Hello, I'm the storm. Again. <laughs> ah, my lady. You did a fine job today. Shannon, go to San. You guys know about Beatrice, right? Huh? Well, I do know of her, of course. Why'd you ask? The two looked at each other. They looked like a pair who had just heard a clueless person suddenly utter a forbidden word. Let's have it straight. Does she exist? That ghost? If it's a question of whether she exists or not, I would have to say that she doesn't. Probably. I... I'm sure she exists. Why? Have you ever met her? I've never met her directly, but... Shannon spoke in detail of how she'd sometimes feel a strange presence or see a silhouette while doing the midnight rounds. And each time she started, Jessica would immediately cut her off, saying she must have seen it wrong or been mistaken. You haven't met her either, right, Goda-san? Of course not. However, well, he was being very evasive. Even a man as big as Goda was apparently unable to deny the existence of someone he'd never met. This really didn't sit well with Jessica. She was a resident of the mansion herself. They were acting as though someone else, someone she didn't know, was living here. Of course, she didn't like it. Wait a sec. Tell me that story one more time. Huh? 
What do you mean? A story about the VIP room? Golda and Shannon had been recounting several ghost stories about Beatrice. One of those drew a reaction from Jessica. Yeah, that one. Sounds pretty cool. Golda and Shannon glanced at each other. After all, it hadn't been a cool story to either of them. You mean, that you mustn't enter the VIP room at 2 o'clock in the morning? The one about how Beatrice Sammer returns to the VIP room every morning at 2am, so you mustn't go near it? Yeah, that's it. Pretty cool. All the other stories are about people saying they heard or saw something Beatrice-like, but this one isn't. This one says that if you go to the VIP room at 2am, you can actually meet Beatrice Sammer. Oh, I wonder. My lady, they say that servants who speak ill of Beatrice Sammer are cursed. Furthermore, the VIP room is Beatrice Sammer's room. Even you, my lady, should probably reconsider. VIP room is locked now, right? Where's the key? Was the key in the key box? I think Genji Sama keeps that key by his own chair. The master key can unlock it too, right? Let me borrow yours. But I cannot do that. Lady, there's no need to approach such an ill omened place without reason. Hey, don't you go calling my house ill omened? Anyway, I've made up my mind. If you can't give me a master key, there's still that key for the VIP room, right? Let me borrow it. Lady. To Jessica, the expressions worn by the pair felt more like an ill omen than anything else did. In Jessica's eyes, the ill omen thing wasn't the witch or the VIP room. It was them, Maria and the others who believed in witches. In the end, Jessica forced them to agree, and she made them bring her the key to the VIP room. She went on a classic test of courage to see if Beatrice would really appear in the VIP room or not. Pretty much. Still, I wonder why I was so fixated on doing it. I must still have been brooding over that fight I had with little Maria. Of course, the weather just had to be terrible on that particular night. To be honest, I slightly regretted sticking my nose into something so pointless. But I'd already said so much, and even borrowed the key from them. I couldn't just go, in, go to Shannon the next day, have her ask me how it went, and answer, Well, I gave up, because it was too scary. Tee <laughs> Normally, I go to sleep long before 2am. If Mom found me wandering the hallways or the corridors at that time of night, she'd definitely yell at me. So I waited in my room, staring at the hands of my clock as it ticked closer to 2am. Outside, the rain was incredible, and the wind strong. The swaying, rustling trees were particularly eerie. I'd complained to Shannon and Goda about making up ghost stories about my house. But I was starting to feel like those ghost stories might not be so impossible after all. The Ishiramaya Mansion is huge. Honestly, I can't think of the entire mansion as my own house. As Mom says, the hallways of the Ishiramaya Mansion should be treated like public roads. In other words, my own room is part of my home, but the hallways and the rooms I don't usually enter are outside. So while part of me felt that this VIP room ghost story was ridiculous, another part of me was so creeped out that it kept fa frantically trying to convince itself that the first part of me was right. Only 10 minutes left till 2. If I want to be inside the VIP room at 2, I need to get there before then. Guess it's time. Sorry, but I'm not giving up that easy. Nothing's going to happen. I know that. It'll just be a stupid waste of time for a few minutes. I touched the doorknob to the door of my room and was startled by how unpleasantly cold it was. As long as I stayed in this room, I could laugh off anything. After all, this was my room, but it wouldn't be like that in the hallway. That's outside my territory, and the doorknob, the barrier between the two, is ice cold. Idiot. What are you so scared of, me? You aren't taking Shannon's, Goda-san's, or maybe Kumasawa-san's gossip seriously, are you? I'll prove it. There's nothing strange in the VIP room. The corridor was only dimly lit. Before lights out time, the hallways were brighter. But to avoid wasting energy or something like that, we kept the lights to a minimum at night. So even though I was inside my own house, it was very clearly the middle of the night here.
If Mom found out that I was wandering around at a time like this to do a test of courage in the VIP room, which I'm not even supposed to go in, I'd get in a lot of trouble. To make sure she didn't find out, I tried to hide my breathing up my footsteps, so the silence felt unbelievably loud. Even though it was so quiet, that eerie sound of the wind was noisy. The sound of twigs rustling. The sound of some pillar in this old mansion creaking. What's that sound like a beak tapping against glass? Though it was so quiet, all of the little suspicious sounds made it seem noisy. Damn, I'm, I'm an idiot. Why couldn't I have brought a flashlight at least? A flashlight to use inside my own home? Huh, that's even more idiotic. I mumbled this to myself, hoping it would drown out the sound of the wind just a little. Then I saw it. The door to the VIP room. This was the VIP room, the room for important guests. However, as far as I knew, it had never been used before. None of the guests who came to the mansion were important enough to be given use of this room. Though I'd been clutching that key the whole time, it didn't feel warm at all. It still ruthlessly and icily tormented me. Or maybe that was a warning. If you go back to your comfortable room and hide in your bed, this night will pass like any other. Don't mess with me. I can't give up after coming this far. Even though the key was freezing in my hand, tell me to go back. It slipped into the keyhole quite easily. All that's left is to turn the knob, open it, and I'll be inside the VIP room. It's not like I've never been in there before. Long ago, I explored and played hide and seek all the time, and this room that I rarely entered seemed unusual and exciting. However, I got in trouble for going in, and was told that this room was important, so one mustn't enter without reason. After that, they made a rule of locking up unused rooms, and I couldn't go in anymore. So it's probably been several years since I've gone into the VIP room. In fact, it might be more than 10 years since the last time. The inside of the room has probably changed from how I remember it. Come to think of it, even then, I felt that there was something uns unsettling about it. Slowly, I pushed the door open. The door was light, and even after I let go of it, it kept opening by itself as though beckoning me in. Beyond it was a darkness as thick and heavy as ink. Even the dim light that peeked in from the corridor seemed bright in contrast. Oh. I stuck my head in, feeling about for the light switch next to the doorway. This was a horribly awkward and uncomfortable way to do it. All I really had to do was step inside and search for the switch from there. Unwilling to take even a single step into the room, I timidly stuck just my arm into the darkness and felt along the wall. There. Click. The switch, which was hardly ever used, felt stiff and lifeless. However, once the light turned on, the darkness vanished in an instant. And there, exactly as it had been, as though not a thing had changed in all these years, was the VIP room. The curtain and bed cover might have been slightly different, and maybe the chairs and the like had changed too. Still, if I had put, had to put it in words, I'd call it the feel. The stiff, lifeless feel of this room hadn't changed. If I hang around here, someone might find me. I'd rather not have Mom find me here. I readied myself, and though I couldn't even bring myself to enter the room when the lights were out, I finally entered. As soon as I closed the door, I felt an oppressive, suffocating sensation. Alright, I've shut myself up in the VIP room. Bring it, Beatrice. What time is it now? I looked around the room, but I couldn't see any clock. I'm not in the habit of wearing a watch around the house. Damn. No, I'm not sure what time it is. Still, I know this only a few minutes left at most. I tried to suppress my desire to use going to get a clock as an excuse to run away from this place. Even so, just standing around like this was boring. When I looked around again, searching for something to sit on, I found something strange. What's this? It had been placed on the side table next to the bed. If this room had been, been used often, I'd have thought it was just one of the owner's personal belongings. But no one lived in this room, so this can't belong to the room's owner. 
What is this? An offering or something? Creepy. It really did look like an offering. A small French doll was sitting on the side table. The doll's hair was gold. It was wearing a black dress. Just who managed to find this doll, and where? There's no doubt that someone placed the doll here to symbolise Beatrice. Does that mean this doll is supposed to be the owner of this room or something? And looking like an offering to that owner, there sat a small plate with several cookies and wrapped chocolates. It was all set out neatly, and there was no dust piled up on the doll. In other words, both the doll and the offering were taken care of on a regular basis by the servants, kept in good condition along with the rest of the room. Taken care of? No, it's more than that. It looked like an offering. No, like some sort of worship. A prayer saying, please don't curse us. So even though the doll was more than eerie enough by itself, viscerally, it was even more unnerving to an imagine it being, uh, being, being kept safe and worshipped in a place like this. Stupid. Am I supposed to clap my hands together and say, please don't curse me? Jessica forced herself to look away from the bizarre doll. She couldn't bring herself to sit on a bed that wasn't hers. Then again, she didn't really feel like sitting down on a chair either. She'd lost any desire to sit on anything in this room. I wandered about aimlessly, then peeked out the window through the gaps in the curtains to stare at the dark, rainy night. What the hell am I doing? Hanging about in the VIP room this late just because that fight with Maria is still eating at me? This is totally pointless. Beatrice, just when did that strange witch start living in this mansion? Grandfather's always yelling about Beatrice. Since it's apparently the name of his dead mistress, people started talking about her, or how her ghost must haunt this mansion. Excuse me. There's that kid's horror story about the witch in the forest, which might be a ghost story made by the adults to stop the kids from going in there. The portrait Grandfather had hung in April was really striking, and there was also that weird epitaph creepy words on that which sounded like some sort of ceremony with human sacrifices made the name of Beatrice seem all the more unnerving. At some point those stories mix together and now people say that the witch Beatrice exists. I don't believe in Beatrice because I know she's just a fictional person made by the fusion of a few horror stories. The Beatrice who was grandfather's mistress probably did exist but she wasn't a witch. The story of the Witch of the Forest was made up by the adults to prevent their kids from getting lost in the woods. But that was just a made up story, not reality. In fact, I've heard that the adults here once scared the kids with stories about wolves living in the forest. Apparently, the kids realised that wolves couldn't possibly be there, so it was changed to the Witch. When the portrait was hung, that once vague character suddenly had a face, and people acted as though she'd been around since long ago. That's right, it's all a ghost story someone made. A fiction. And Maria calls Beatrice her best friend, and the servant worship her like a household shrine. I just don't get it, and it creeps me out. A phone call at 2am. The sudden ring of the phone made me jump so hard, I thought my heart would explode. There was a phone on the bedside table across from the one with the doll, and it was ringing noisily. However, I was only surprised by the first ring. By the time it had rung three times, I'd regained my cool enough to grumble about this being a prank done by someone trying to scare me. If I rush to pick it up, I'll probably hear someone laughing at me, saying, Were you scared? I thought about ignoring it instead, but it kept on ringing incessantly. It was a pretty loud sound to have going on and on this late at night. If Mum somehow manages to hear it from her room, I'm screwed. Okay, okay, I've got it, I've got it. Might as well say, you scared me, or whatever. I decided to pick up the receiver. I'll just say, that surprised me. Wahaha. <laughs> and maybe follow that up with, looks like Beatrice didn't show up after all. After all, this is my victory, in a sense. Hello? Oh, hi Beatrice. Huh? Maria? I don't get it. Did I hear that wrong? Why would Maria be calling here? Hello? Thanks for teaching me that fun song last time. In my turn, I'm gonna sing you a song, Beatrice. I just learned this one. Oh. The voice, the intonation, the manner of speech, all of it clearly belonged to Maria. But what's she talking about all by herself? 
Maria just kept on talking happily as I stood there, stunned and unable to interrupt. Eventually, Maria started singing an old fam uh, familiar kid's song that even I knew. I don't get it. Maria, hello? Wait a sec, stop singing. What's going on? I don't get it. Hello? <sighs> the voice and the lights, everything disappeared. In the pitch black, I couldn't see anything. Couldn't tell what was happening. I don't get it. What's going on? the hell was that? Does being in darkness really slow us humans down so much? I know it's dark, but I really have absolutely no idea what just happened. What was that shuffling sound just now? I'm not sure. I can't explain it. I heard an incredible slithering sound, like someone crawling out of a bed. I didn't think I'd heard it. It wasn't that vague. I definitely heard it happen, right next to me, clearly. However, there was no change to the bed. No one had been sleeping there in the first place, and the sheets were still perfectly straight. Someone had crawled out of the bed, and had laughed in a creepy voice before leaving the room. That's what it felt like. Felt like I'm here, and the bed's right there. Not only in the same room, I'm right next to it. So why am I so unsure about what happened just a few seconds ago? I gripped the receiver, which had gone completely silent, and waited there alone, unable to move, in a quiet room that seemed exactly identical to the one I'd entered. Huh? What? If nothing's changed since the beginning, I could just pretend that the last minute or so didn't happen. And yet, if something has changed, that would prove that something really did happen. The hell, wh where'd it go? Did it fall to the floor? No, it's not there. No matter where I look, from whatever angle, it's not there. The offering plate with the cookies and chocolate is still here, but the thing they were being offered to... The doll is gone. No way. Then what just happened? Is the Beatrice Sama doll supposed to have cackled out loud and left the room? Oh, that crawling sound was too loud to have been made by a doll. It was a noisy sort of sound, like a kid playing with a blanket and using it as a cape. Then what? Is that Beatrice Sama doll supposed to have turned into a human and then run cackling from the room? No way. After that, nothing happened. The doll alone disappeared, and nothing else changed. In a VIP room that had remained completely unchanged, and was filled only with the sound of wind and rain, I stood there, too shocked to move. Did you ever find that doll? I looked everywhere, even under the bed. But I didn't find it. Just what did you think had happened in that room? I don't think it was actually Beatrice Sama's curse. It might have been a prank done by the servants. A prank? Maybe they recorded Maria's voice beforehand. They then called at exactly 2am and pushed the play button. They could have cut the power at the switchboard or something. Then, someone who'd been hiding in the VIP room would make a creepy laugh, take the doll, and leave. If that's how it happened, everything fits. Doesn't sound like you're really convinced. No kidding. After all, if that was just a prank to scare me, the scale was way too large. They made Maria sing beforehand and recorded it. Then someone called the VIP room and replayed that recording. Then someone waited until exactly the right time and tripped the breaker for the BA uh, VIP room. To turn off the power to the VIP room, you'd have to go to the basement. It's a switchboard booth down in the boiler room. There's no phone line down there, so you'd need a different person to play back Maria's tape. And you'd need another person to hide in the VIP room and cackle before leaving. Just how long would this last person have to hide in the VIP room beforehand? How long would they have to hide in the pitch black VIP room under the bed, for example? Waiting to scare Jessica, who might or might not even come. There's no way it could be a witch's curse. But still, to me, it's even creepier to imagine that many people planning everything down to the slightest detail. I'm waiting for several hours in the darkness just to scare me. I agree. A curse would be better. Did you ask the servants about that later on? What's the point? They just played dumb, of course. And there had to have been at least three of them. On that day, Genji-san, Goda-san, Kumasawa-san, and Shannon stayed the night. So three of those four helped out with that creepy prank? 
It doesn't make sense. That's why I couldn't ask about it. True, it had been a strange experience for her, but it wasn't something completely impossible for humans to do. Even so, it really must have been more unnerving to imagine a large number of people planning so carefully just to scare Jessica. It's no surprise that Jessica found this scarier than Beatrice's curse. Do you still believe the servants tricked you? No. I was probably scared and mistook what I saw and heard. The door probably just fell somewhere. I just had trouble finding it. Are you trying to say you imagined the whole thing? Other than the doll disappearing, there was no other proof that anything had happened or changed. Later on, I talked to Maria and she said she didn't know anything about that song or the phone call. I don't know if she was lying or not, of course. Anyway, what happened that night? It's just something I thought happened and it's no proof of any kind. That's ironic. Even if you claimed to have met Beatrice directly, you would have just as un uh, been just as unable to prove it. The shock lasted for a while, but as time passed, I began to think that lightning or something must have shut off the power for a second. And maybe one of the trees in the garden fell, which I mistook for that slithering sound. And the laugh? Maybe some strange bird. Anyway, I might have misheard something to get that sound. I act tough, but you won't believe how much of a coward I actually am. That's why I let my imagination get a hold of me. I tried to use that as an excuse to help me forget everything that happened that night. And everything is enshrouded in darkness. People are actually pretty good at forgetting things if they try. After that night, I'd feel uncomfortable every time I heard the word Beatrice. But I tried hard not to let it show on my face. That's all. I can't tell you any more than that. It's kind of embarrassing, so please don't tell anyone. I don't want them knowing I'm a chicken. Sure thing. I have one last question. About the VIP room? No. About the dining hall. The dining hall? On the day of the family conference, just before your ghost story, all the relatives were gathered in the dining hall, right? Yeah. Except Butler hadn't come back to the family yet. Everyone else was there. Everyone except Grandfather, of course, and Angie. Yep, and Angie wasn't in the room because of her stomachache. Her seat was next to yours, wasn't it? Yep. Was that the seat to your right? Yeah, the seat to my right. Why does it matter? Hmm? Wait. That's strange. Why to the... That's enough. Try not to think. You'll just get a headache. What's up, Jessica? Why the confused look? Uh, right. Left. Huh? <laughs> You're so weird. How's it going, Will? Have George Nissan and Jessica told you anything useful? A bit. That ghost story about Beatrice was pretty fun. A ghost story? What kind of story? The one about Beatrice's ghost appearing in the VIP room at 2am in the morning. It was pretty creepy. I've never heard of that. I don't know who put that out there, but that'd be really rude, making up ghost stories about the woman our head is indebted to. A model answer. What? Do you know about the epitaph, Leon? Epitaph? What epitaph? That epitaph by Beatrice's portrait. My apologies, but I have no idea what you mean. Behold the sweet fish river, running through my beloved hometown. What on earth are you talking about? How does he not know? So in your world, no, in this world, the portrait exists but not the epitaph. Of course, I know about the large portrait of Beatrice hanging in the entrance hall. But I haven't heard of this epitaph. What is it? That's a very interesting difference. You've lived in Rockinjima all your life, right? Of course. What's your point? When you were a little kid, you were told not to go near the woods. Threatened about it? Yes. They always said to stay away, since it would be dangerous if we got lost. Because a witch lives in the forest. A witch? What witch? The Golden Witch, ruler of Rockinjima's night. Beatrice. Beatrice is a woman to whom Grandfather owes a great debt. Don't you think it's a bit rude to treat her like a witch or a ghost? You don't know about the witch, Beatrice? I know about the Beatrice who came here in a submarine along with the gold, and about her daughter, who was raised in a hidden mansion. We just learned about those two, act uh, those two together a short while ago, right? Where did the witch come in? I see, so that's it. Then how did they scare you to keep you from going into the woods? They said that wolves lived in the forest. Wolves, but not a witch. I see. That's interesting. Not to me. What are you talking about? 
What is the switch? I'm just talking to myself. I have one more question. Please go ahead. During the family conference, who sits to your right at the dining table? My little sister, Jessica, sits across from me. The next in rank is Aunt Eva's son, so George Nissan's the one on my right. What's your point? I get it. It's all mashed together in a confusing mess. But it is interesting. I'm still in the dark here. Why is it all so different? This whole arc has been really different from everything else in the game. I've enjoyed it. It's been a breath of fresh air. It's very different. And I've even enjoyed this, this just this episode on its own. There's been like this mini sort of old school horror ghost story. You know, I've really enjoyed it. Feels like it could have been a Goosebumps story or something. <laughs> or something when you sat around a, a campfire. Or, you know. Anyways, that's it for today. This has been Greeny XI. Hope you've enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again in a bit when it looks like we're going back to the church to have a bit of a conversation with Leon. Who knows? <laughs> that's good for watching, folks. See you again in a bit.